Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. In recent times, it has become unpopular to admit when you're wrong. You're supposed to double down, strike back at your accusers, admit no wrongdoing. Well, I don't submit to these trends or many trends. And I'm going to start today by sharing some times that I have been wrong. And I don't mean like I made a mistake or I got a few questions wrong in a test. Obviously that stuff happens. <laughs> I'm talking about things that I was wrong, but was like trying to convince other people that I was that these things were correct. And I later found out that I sounded like a, a moron the whole time. The first one is, and I believe this well into college, uh, I was convinced that Malaysia is not a real country, and that it was in fact made up for the movie Zoolander, where a central plot point is the attempted assassination of the Prime Minister of Malaysia. Now, it's possible that I thought it was a region or something, or like a subcontinent of Asia, but I certainly thought the idea of there being a Prime Minister of Malaysia was ridiculous. Well, now fast forward, I work for a company that sells products, and by products I mean missiles, to Malaysia, the very real country. I have been in meetings recently where we talk about the upcoming sale to Malaysia. And I sit there thinking, good thing there's no one in this room who thought that country was fake. (laughs) And the head, uh, and, and I did some more research, the head of their executive branch is actually the prime minister. This is him. So it turns out I was wrong. I remember saying this out loud to real people that this country does not exist. Whoops. (laughs) Whoops. <laughs> uh, the next one is more recent, uh, a month or so ago. Um, and this is actually when I started thinking about all the times I've been wrong loudly um, and then found out I was, or thought I was right loudly and found out I was wrong. Um, I thought that cinnamon had zero absorbed calories, or put more crassly, that you poop out 100% of the cinnamon that you consume. Here was my thought process. First, I've had some experience eating cinnamon and also experienced the near immediate bathroom trip afterwards. Second, I couldn't imagine someone surviving on an all cinnamon diet. In fact, if there were two people, one fasting for seven days and one eating only cinnamon, I I would have said that they would be at at worst the exact same weight at the end, if not the cinnamon eater would be lighter. (laughs) Um, But here are the actual nutrition facts, courtesy of the USDA, highlighting added by me. As it turns out, (laughs) cinnamon contains some amount of fat, protein, and sugar, all of which are generally metabolized in food. In other words, it is not 100% passed through to the toilet water. However, despite being wrong in magnitude, I do want to point out the huge amount of fiber highlighted in green. This is a strong indicator that the core of my belief about cinnamon was in fact correct. I was simply overzealous in my conclusions. I would argue that I was figuratively correct, not literally correct. See the message entitled, I am the Good Shepherd, two series back for a rundown on the difference since the terms have become more confused in recent years. And yes, I'm looking at you, Zane, he who says he is literally insane. (laughs) In both of these situations, I was wrong. And in both situations, the internet was quickly able to, able to clear things up. I found maps and images of the country of Malaysia. I was able to find their current government structure and their, a picture of their current prime minister. I found the nutrition facts for cinnamon, and really this research took very little time. So, with this glorious resource through the internet at our fingertips, um, clearly as a society we must be becoming more correct, converging on the truth, and we must be a place where ridiculous claims are quickly proven false and people's minds are changed when convincing evidence is presented. Except somehow it seems like the opposite is happening. We have become less clear on what is true and what is fact than ever before. More often, or really more often, the opposing sides are both sure of facts um, that really cannot both be true. And I think the biggest reason is that the internet, and more specifically social media, has given everyone a platform. 
You see, I was able to easily quick or quickly check data on what are essentially research and encyclopedia type sites. But these are not the popular places that people go for content. They go to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and YouTube. And this is where people can voice their opinions, either as opinions, as they often are, or more frequently as facts with little or no backup. And when we go to these sites, uh, we ostensibly have control over whose content we see. Um, by who we choose to follow, subscribe to, or be friends with. Um, and for a lot of us, this is just people who we know in real life. Uh, but there are also people who we follow primarily because we think they have interesting lives. And this could be just because we find what they post or do entertaining, but sometimes it is because we want to imitate part of their lives. It could be their fashion, their philanthropy, uh, their humor, or maybe we think they give really good advice um, in areas like fitness or nutrition, personal finance, mindfulness, or something else. For me, the things that get pushed to my feed because I went looking for them <laughs> um, are um, people who have built up like big passive income streams, which is like residual income, like dividends or rental income of like 100K per, per year or more, or someone touting their, their great new dumbbell related home exercise program. And these are people who I would potentially like to imitate in those specific areas. Um, but there are some issues that can arise uh, when you do this sort of thing. One is just because someone is pretty good and worthy of imitating in one area, uh, doesn't mean that they know much of anything about other areas that they talk about. For instance, it would not be good for any of my friends in college uh, to think just because I was right on many, many things in college, probably too many to count. Um, <laughs> they, if they also believe, like bought into my lack of belief in the country of Malaysia, that would be a problem. <laughs> um, you see, we tend to let people who give good advice in one area influence us in other areas as well even when they go from being an expert to being really average or completely ignorant like I was in college. Um, the second issue is if I'm focused on personal finance and home workouts, and those are the people I follow and articles I read, what about questions like, hey, is generating $100,000 of annual passive income the right way to be spending your time and focus, Brad? And what do you do when you get that 100K of passive income? Or is the amount of time that you're spending working out appropriate? Should you prioritize time with your family or developing relationships or spiritual practice instead? See, the algorithms and these social media follows won't help me there. They will stick with feeding me content that I'm interested in and that confirms my lifestyle and choices instead of challenging them. What I really need is a full life follow, someone I can model my overall life after, my choices of how to spend my time, what really matters in the world, and what my real purpose is all of the bigger, harder questions that we all face in our lives. And this is a big part of what we're going to talk about today as we continue to follow the story uh, of Elisha in the Old Testament, this idea of trying to be like someone. Questions like, what makes somebody worth, worthy to be followed and, and imitated in this way? And is there really anyone that we should be this devoted to, or should we just be our own masters? After all, we're told by athletes and celebrities that they are not role models. Um, and really treating people this way is often called idolizing them, which sounds sinful. But is this really the only way to follow and learn from another person? And what if someone wants to follow us? Is that an okay thing? Um, should we be comfortable leading and mentoring other people? And kind of what are the pitfalls there? These are the things that we're gonna go through today by looking at the last day of Elisha's internship or apprenticeship with Elijah, similarly named but different, the famed prophet of the northern kingdom of Israel at the time. We'll talk through one of the most miraculous passages in the Old Testament and see if we can apply what we see there to our lives and our walks with God. All right, to set the stage on where we are in Elisha's life, last week, Megan Stibrich taught us about Elisha's call to be a prophet. When Elijah, remember, Jah, older, more established prophet, Shah, <laughs> new prophet, um, following in his footsteps. When Elijah tossed his cloak or mantle over Elisha's shoulder, Elisha killed his oxen, burned his plow, signifying that he was leaving behind his old life of wealth and security to follow in Elijah's footsteps as a prophet of God. That seems like quite the difficult choice, you might say. 
What went into that decision and how does that apply to my life? Well, for those answers, go watch last week's message. The story kind of builds on itself. That's how we made this series. <laughs> so we pick up the story, as the Bible does, six to seven years after this calling, when Elijah's life is nearing its end. Here's what we read in 2 Kings. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, As surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, Did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. Now the next four to six, or the next verses, verses four to six, mirror these. Um, with them traveling first here to Gilgal, or from Gilgal to um, to Bethel, then they go to Jericho, and then to the Jordan River. And each time Elijah tells Elisha to stay behind, and Elisha responds with, "I will never leave you." Or in the message translation, he says, "Not on your life. I'm not letting you out of my sight." We also see in those verses another time where a group of prophets. Prophets has that same conversation with Elisha, asking him if he knows the Lord is going to take his master away today. So what does all of this mean? Well, the first thing I want to point out is that there are these groups of prophets, both at Bethel and around Jericho. And this is significant because right before Elijah goes to call Elisha six to seven years prior, so right before the story we went through last week, he cries out in despair to the Lord that, or saying that, I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty, but the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, and killed every one of your prophets. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. So at that time, Elijah is saying he is the only one left, but now we see these other groups of prophets. So it seems that new prophets have risen up in the meantime. Reading up on these groups, and I, this is a little bit of speculation because it doesn't say, they are believed to be followers of Elijah, essentially. Um, parts of what, is, what was reported in the text, 7,000 Israelites who stayed committed to the Lord um, through Ahab and Jezebel's reign, where the idolatry of the northern kingdom of Israel was at its height. And it's their reign where all of these prophets were killed and where Elijah had to run for his life over and over again. Um, so these, these new um, groups of prophets were probably living in some level of secrecy and seclusion since, since these rulers at the time killed prophets of God um, and, that the, um, and that they had as the official kind of worship or religion was worship of Baal and Asherah. And I kind of envision them like an underground resistance to the oppressive and evil powers of the day, uh, which sounds kind of awesome when you say it like that, but these would have been people living in very real danger. Think of, um, of the Jews in hiding and the people who helped them, uh, helped hide them from the Nazis during World War II and when they were in power. So for relevance to our story, these are people who probably knew Elijah and Elisha well. And it also gives some context that if Elisha would have stayed behind as Elijah asked him to, he wouldn't have been left to fend for himself, but would have had a friendly community to stay with. Which brings me to the other piece of this I want to highlight. That three times Elijah says to Elisha, stay here for the Lord has told me to go to enter the place, Bethel, Jericho, Jordan. And all three times Elisha responds with, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. Or the kind of cooler sounding, <laughs> not on your life, I'm not letting you out of my sight. And my first reaction to reading this and, you know, reading through this as I knew I was going to speak on it, was that I probably would have just been like, all right, boss, <laughs> if the Lord told you to go to these places and for me not to come with, I guess I'll catch up with you later. <laughs> um, and I'm also a bit surprised that there isn't more of a fight, which made me think, like, is this like when everyone at a dinner knows who's going to pay for it? Like when you all go out for dinner, uh, but other people are still offering because that's like the polite thing to do. Or, you know, you want to be like, I, I really would be willing to pay, but I know you're going to insist like eight times, so I'm not going to try. Um, or was this a test 
that Elisha clearly knew the answer to, and really Elijah is just taking a super long walk, which, you know, as an aside, walking these distances at that time would have taken the entire day. It's like 40 miles. Um, was he just doing that to test Elisha's devotion? Um, and strangely enough, I don't have a definitive answer here. Again, the text doesn't really say, but I think we can get pretty close to an answer by using some context. First, I want to call back uh, to last week again. This was the primary text. It said, so Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. And just prior to this, God told Elijah to anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from the town of Abel Mahalah to replace you as my prophet. And that interaction that we just read about and that we talked about last week was Elijah saying, come follow me, learn what I do because you will replace me. You will be God's prophet after me. Remember back to the group of prophets in the story. They did not get the throwing of the cloak across their shoulders. This is a different relationship. Elisha goes everywhere with Elijah and he has done so for six to seven years after burning his oxen and plow. And this is a similar relationship to what we see with Jesus' disciples, where they are always with him. They are not his only followers. All through the Gospels, we read of people Jesus heals or preaches to, and they believe him and either become one of his followers, um, or they just believe in him and and don't follow him. Um, But similar to the groups of prophets at Bethel or Jericho, they don't go everywhere with him. They don't eat every meal with him, walk with him on his travels, and stay where he stays. This is the difference between a follower and a disciple. And I think this relationship is evidenced by the fact that Elijah is even telling Elisha that he needs to stay behind. Clearly the default in their relationship is that Elisha is going wherever Elijah goes and him staying would be a change to their normal course. And I wanna pause here a little bit to talk for a while um, about this way of learning from another person that we see with Elijah and Elisha and that we similarly see with Jesus and his 12 main disciples. The idea here is that to become like someone, you stay with them always. In the case of disciples at Jesus' time, the disciples would sit at the feet of the teacher or the rabbi, which is kind of like learning under them, sitting at their feet, and they would walk around behind them. And the the combination of these two things, following them everywhere and kneeling at their feet to learn, the disciple was said to be covered in the dust of the rabbi. And for an example of what this looked like, and really a very countercultural, scandalous example, let's look at a familiar story from Luke about Jesus and two sisters. It says, as Jesus and the disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, my dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it and it will not be taken away from her. Now, this is not usually what's emphasized in the story, but to the people of Jesus' day, it would have been clear that Mary was taking the posture of a disciple here, or at the very least as a student under Jesus' teaching as a rabbi. Sitting in his feet and learning from him is a a position traditionally available only to men. Martha is doing what a good Judean woman is supposed to do when there are guests, and Mary is breaking conventions and cultural norms to learn at Jesus' feet like a disciple. She would have been right next to Peter and James, Andrew, Philip, and Bartholomew. This is where disciples, people who were training to be like the rabbi, sat. And this is what Jesus meant when he came to those same disciples and told them to follow him. When he did that, it says, Jesus called out to them, come follow me and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. See, Jesus wasn't asking these men, and in this case it was Peter and Andrew, to believe in him or to repent from their sins, which he asked everyone to do. Um, He meant stop being a fisherman and instead be a disciple of, of a rabbi, as me as your rabbi. 
in Jesus. Change your life. Follow me wherever I go so you can learn to be like me. This is the call that Jesus made to his disciples. And this is the call that Elijah made to Elisha when he threw his cloak over him. And I think this is why Elisha won't leave Elijah's side. It's his commitment to go wherever Elijah goes, to see what he does, to hear what he says, and to learn to be what he is. The second reason I think Elisha doesn't stay behind, that I think we do kind of see from the text, is that he knows what is coming. He knows God is not calling Elijah to these places to spend some time in solitude. It is because this is the day God will take Elijah away. We see in the conversation with the prophets, they say to Elisha, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answers, but be quiet about it. I think it's also possible or even likely that Elisha knows that Elijah will be taken by God in a miraculous way. It's also possible that in trying to figure out how he is going to take Elijah's place. And just remember, Elijah was this larger-than-life figure. Um, If you you read several chapters earlier in 1 Kings, there's this big confrontation on Mount Carmel where he prays to God, and God brings down fire on his altar that's covered in water, and he miraculously kind of shows the people that, look, the God is the real God, not Baal. Um, he's also the only prophet that survived the purging um, that we just read about earlier where all of the other prophets of God are killed. Um, So he's got this very real um, and powerful connection to God. And I think it's possible that Elisha doesn't have that and is kind of concerned that he hasn't learned how to be like Elijah yet. And if he, and if this is his last chance to see that and he misses it, that when he's supposed to step into Elijah's ministry, that he won't have what he needs. All right, let's continue with the story and see what comes next. Remember, now they've gone from Gilgal to Bethel, Bethel to Jericho, and then to the Jordan River, each time Elisha refusing to be left behind and Elijah allowing him to come. It says, 50 men from the group of prophets also went and watched from a distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped beside the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided, and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. If you see me when I am taken from you, then you will get your request. But if not then you won't. So by this passage, it seems like Elisha was right, um, both in that Elijah would be taken away, as he himself says, and apparently that he was right to continually stay with Elijah. Here, um, Elijah doesn't reprimand him for staying with him on his journey. Um, He asks what he can do for Elisha, um, his disciple, before he is taken away. And Elisha, ever the bold one, asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit and to be his successor. Um, Now, when I read this on the surface, it sounds like what he's saying is that I want to have twice the power or be twice the prophet you have been. But after kind of reading up on this passage, I believe this refers most likely to the portion that a firstborn son received at the time. The firstborn always received a double portion. Um, So I think it's likely that Elisha is saying, I want to be your firstborn, your heir, Um, in your ministry. So it would be more similar to, I want to be like you. I want to do what you have done and continue your work, Um, which at least sounds better than the more arrogant, I want to be twice as powerful as you. Um, It's also interesting and I think appropriate that Elijah essentially says that he can't grant Elisha's request, that God's spirit isn't really his to give, um, but that if he sees him taken away, he will get his request. Uh, That part's a little weird. I assume it has something, it's something that Elijah knew to be true from his connection with God. Uh, Maybe something that Elisha also knew um, to be the case based on his behavior in this passage and him not wanting to let Elijah out of his sight when he knows what's coming. All right, let's read on to see how this plays out. As they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them, and Elijah was carried by a whirlwind into heaven. 
Elisha saw it and cried out, My father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared from sight, Elisha tore his clothes in distress. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when he was taken up. Then Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. So Elijah is taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. There is a chariot of fire involved with horses of fire that drives between the two men. Elisha sees it all, then picks up Elijah's cloak, representing his work and his position as a prophet of God, and appears to have, in fact, been anointed with God's spirit, just as Elijah was to continue his work. Through the power of the spirit, he is now able to strike the Jordan River with the cloak, and it divides just as it did for Elijah on the other side. Now in our kind of superhero summer study of Elisha, this is the end of his origin story. It's like in Batman when he's, you know, leaving and coming back to Gotham. <laughs> it is the beginning of his ministry to the people uh, and the rules of Israel, and eventually to some Gentiles as well, which will involve many miraculous signs and a powerful connection to God. So at this point, because, um, you know, the story is kind of winding up, we kind of ask ourselves, what are we to learn from this story and this relationship between Elijah and Elisha? And I want to call us back um, to kind of where we started with the idea of social media and influencers and looking for someone to really follow for our whole lives. And really, this is what the relationship between Elijah and Elisha is. Uh, and this is also the relationship we see in the Bible between Jesus and his 12 disciples. So my question for us today is, who do you want to model your life after? Who do you want to be the Elijah to your Elisha? Or to remove the constant confusion of their names sounding the same, <laughs> who do you want to be the Jesus to your Peter or your James, son of Alphaeus? He's one of the 12 disciples. Go check. <laughs> and I'm going to allow everyone two answers, which will play right into my application points, strangely enough. Um, we'll start with the easy one. Jesus. Um, standard answer, Sunday school answer. Um, but the reason that is a thing is because Jesus being the answer to a lot of our questions and our desires is correct. Um, and I'm going to spend maybe less time here because it's very similar to an application I just did in the last message I gave. But really, the only person that it makes sense for us to follow in this sort of stay with them always, I want to be like you sort of way in all parts of my life is Jesus. Now, this doesn't mean that there aren't people we should follow in this way to a point, um, but the only one who we should completely surrender to and allow to change all parts of our lives, that kind of whole life follow, like I talked about, is Jesus. And this is a situation where spending all of your time with him and the whole I won't let you out of my sight thing uh, makes sense. It's hard, um, but spending a day with Jesus is a spiritual practice that you can absolutely do. Um, John Artberg has some really good content on this. So does John Mark Comer. And there's also a great book that we did a series on a couple of year, years ago called With by Sky Jathani. And in general, kind of my summary of this from my memory, <laughs> uh, for an ordinary day, the idea is to consistently pray through your day with Jesus, keeping your mind focused on him being right there with you, which is always true even when you don't focus on it. So as you get up, you kind of start the day's conversation through prayer. As you eat breakfast, you talk about what you have coming up in your day and ask for strength and help. As you work, remember that Jesus is with you. Think about what it means to be his follower in your job as you interact with your coworkers, your clients, and employees. Um, let Jesus be a regular part of your life, continually reorient, reorienting your focus and mind to him throughout the day. I am not good at doing this. I have done it before. It's good, but it's, it's not necessarily easy. It's very easy to get distracted in our world. Um, another thing you can do in this arena that I will encourage is really a resource on how to do this better and on some of the context I talked about. Um, it's the content on discipleship by Ray Vanderlaan. I brought this up in, in the last message I gave to. He has a website with a bunch of resources called That the World May Know. Um, it, it's all very good on unpacking the cultural context, so it's all similar in that way, but I think I found the stuff that I actually listened to. There's a link to it in the Bible app event page, 
And in this link, um, the content I remember is in the Idaho lectures section, and it's number 10, Discipleship One. It's like 50 or so minutes. Um, and I'm sure all of this content is good. I certainly have not consumed all of it. Probably this one thing is the main thing I've consumed. Um, but it really unpacks what it meant to be a disciple to a rabbi in Jesus' time. All of the, you know, sitting at the at his feet, um, going, following him everywhere, all of that stuff um, is in there and, and much, much more. Um, and based on this content, one application point from... Um, that, I, that I've been doing lately from the last message I gave is going through the Gospels once a month. Um, this is kind of the idea that the closest thing we can do there, other than spending your day with Jesus, like I mentioned, is really to let, God, let Jesus' words through the Gospels wash over you regularly. Uh, I'm currently doing the 30-day Harmony of the Gospels reading plan, the Version app. It's really good. I did another one last month, uh, and it's been really great to focus on Jesus' life and his teaching and his words in this way. I highly recommend it. All right. Now, clearly, Jesus was all of our first choice for who we want to be, who we want to model our life after. But what about if Jesus is removed from the list of candidates? Now, who do you want to be like? Are there people that you see that demonstrate a life or aspects of a life that you are working toward? Someone who is wise or at peace, good with money, or who loves other people in a way that you want to but don't? Is there someone who loves God and knows about him in a way that you would like to imitate? This is another area where we can learn and grow, and that is from other people. We mentioned doing this through social media by following or subscribing to people's content, um, and this is, this is fine and good. I, I don't spend much time on social media, but I do read blogs and listen to podcasts, which isn't really all that different. Um, but what about real life people that you know? Is there a person who you can learn from in your real life? If there is, there's a relationship for that called mentoring, um, which we see all the way back to the early church. So this, this is very much a biblical thing. Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, and you should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. And this is really kind of the crux of what mentoring is. It's someone who you see that is ahead of you in these things that you can learn from and that you want to imitate. And really this exists in a lot of arenas. I've had mentoring relationships uh, professionally through work um, but obviously the kind we're talking about here is, um, is in the spiritual form formation or really whole life sense. Um, and there's actually, there's really actually quite a bit of mentoring that goes on in our community already. One of the things um, mentioned that you may have heard in announcements about being an intern is that you'll be mentored by staff here at DR. Um, and then staff is mentored and cared for by our ministers, Ryan and Megan Miller. And various other people um, in our community are in mentoring relationships. Really, this is something that we do um, and emphasize a lot. And if you're interested in being involved in this, being mentored either in a particular area or in your walk with God in general or just in your life, um, please let us know. Um, now, I, I want to make a distinction here again that I think is important. Being mentored by another person can be and often is really awesome. You can learn a lot. You can build a relationship with another person that is immensely beneficial to both of you and can draw both of you closer to God. However, Remember that a mentor is another person. You are a disciple of Jesus, not of your mentor. Hopefully, this isn't an issue, but it was in the early church. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, aren't you acting just like the people of the world? After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts and Apollos watered it, but it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What is important is that God makes the seed grow. So with that caveat, which is very important, um, our community here is very pro-mentoring. If you want to get involved, if you want to be mentored, let staff know. Or if there's someone you want to be mentored by, you can ask them too. And kind of springing off from this, another more casual way that this can work and does work in our community um, is just intentionally to get to know people in our community that are either older or younger than you, either in you know real life years or just in their faith. Um, 
if you're on the older side, kind of like me, <laughs> invite some of the students or recently graduated people over for dinner and just share your life with them and be intentional about it. Um, just some of this normal interaction and talking about life can have major benefits uh, on both sides, kind of in this arena of mentoring, but without that more formal mentoring relationship. All right, so now, now I wanna talk about the other side, um, being a mentor, so mentoring other people. And I've always been a little uncomfortable doing this, and here's why. Um, I always feel like I'm not actually that good that people should find a better mentor than me. Um, and what I really mean generally is that, first of all, I'm not perfect. <laughs> um, and, you know, if you're going to be mentored, obviously don't expect your mentor to be perfect. That's not fair. <laughs> um, and second, uh, I'm not great at following through on things that I know I should do. Uh, and this has become less true over time, um, but you know it's still true, which makes me feel like a hypocrite. Um, so for instance, like I mentioned earlier, I think spending your day with Jesus is awesome and something we should all do, arguably should do every day. <laughs> but I've really tried this in earnest about three times. Um, and to a smaller, more manageable extent, a few times more than that, still probably less than 20. Um, there's a long list of uh, books on Christian living that I want to that I want to read and go through, um, but I don't get to them very quickly. Um, and there are tons of practices that I know are important, that I say are important, but I don't do enough. So to people considering being mentors, all you are expected to do is your best. All you need to teach people is what you know and what you do. It's okay to admit when you when you aren't good at something and that you're still working on things because you should be. You do not need to be Jesus to people in the sense that you need to be the perfect example. You can show people you mentor what Jesus means in your life, how you connect with him, and you can share what you know. And in this relationship, like most things, really your job is to point people to Jesus as opposed to trying to replace him in that way, which is probably what I'm doing when I'm thinking that I'm not perfect enough to do that. Um, and really, that's what this sort of relationship is, is sharing what you know and what you have experienced with someone else who doesn't know what you know or who can benefit from your experience. And I know for me, the feeling uncomfortable is largely an issue with, within me as opposed to some kind of expectation from God or from somebody else. Um, so by far, the most important thing in this sort of relationship is being willing to do it being committed to doing as well for the person or people you're mentoring as you can and following through. So if this is something you're interested in being a mentor, um, you know, if you have wisdom to impart on people, uh, let us know and we can get you on a list of available mentors and some training in how to do this well. And Megan is actually putting together a mentoring matrix that is designed to do exactly this. All right. So that is what I have for... Um, kind of application for this message. The recap, remember Jesus is your primary mentor. Uh, he is the one that we follow like a disciple. Um, but it's also a good thing and a very practical thing to learn from the other people in your life. Um, a mentoring relationship can be very powerful in your spiritual growth. Um, and then on the other side, um, it can also be very powerful to be a mentor. And it's not purely a you're giving to someone. There's also growth and, um, and you learn as well as a mentor. And that's often uh, not something that people think of when going into it. Um, and to recap where we left the story next week or so as we get ready for next week, uh, at this point, Elijah is gone. He has ascended into heaven. I think we're gonna have one more week where maybe there's a little confusion with names because he still gets talked about next week. But for the most part, that's about to stop. Um, uh, Elisha has taken up his prophet's mantle, signifying that he has taken Elijah's place as the, as the prophet of God. He has requested a double portion of God's spirit that was so evident in Elijah's life and ministry. And we see that he got it when he hits the Jordan River with Elijah's cloak and it divides from the cross. At this point, our holy man, Elisha, has emerged. He has been mentored for years by Elijah and is ready to step into the ministry he left and the danger that comes along with it. Get ready for some wild stories this summer. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you. Um, I thank you that we have these stories, Lord, that we can learn from. Um, I thank you that you gave us your son, um, who we can imitate, Lord, and who we can be true disciples of and who we can spend our day with, God. I pray that we would all learn 
um, to orient our lives to your son, Lord, to be more like him, to grow to be more like him, Lord. We love you. We pray these things in your holy name. Amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at damascusroadtucson.com.